The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard the Sadducees disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The Gospel of the Lord. At this time, I invite children ages 3 to 10 who wish to do so to go with Reverend Adlin for a Bible story and prayers. And it's a special honor and joy to welcome Rabbi Hannah Goldstein to be our preacher this morning. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> that we all do the same, I think. <laughs> I am humbled to stand in your pulpit this morning. Thank you so much for welcoming me to St. Columba's. It is great to see friends and co-conspirators from our shared work as part of the Washington Interfaith Network. And I am grateful for your recent leadership in the Undesign, the Red Line project. It's also great to see a lot of faces from Temple Sinai here this morning. We're not used to a Sunday morning service, so you woke up and you got here. Um, there's also some friends from Riderwood. It's great to see you as well. And we hope that all of you at St. Columba's will join us um, when Reverend Daniel joins us for his part of this pulpit exchange uh, on Friday evening. When Reverend Daniel first proposed a pulpit exchange, I was flattered and thrilled. I have spent more time in church than your average rabbi. My father, who's also a rabbi, served in Andover, Massachusetts, a small New England town with a small Jewish community. His closest clergy colleagues were Christian co clergy, and in particular, he had a very close friendship with the Episcopal priest, the very Reverend James Diamond, Zichrona Livracha, may his memory be a blessing. This led to a great deal of inter-religious collaboration, including a local access television show called The Rabbi and the Rector, <laughs> which was the most embarrassing thing a father could do to his teenage daughter. <laughs> On many Sundays, I found myself warmly greeted in a church pew while my father was guest preaching. As much as my Jewish experiences shaped my religious life and ultimately led me to rabbinical school, those Sunday mornings inspired in me a curiosity, an appreciation, and a sense of kinship with other people of faith. In contemplating this morning's sermon, I reviewed the texts that were included in this Sunday's lectionary, and I was pretty confident that it would be best for me to stick with First Kings or Psalms and leave the Gospels for the experts. Stay in your lane, Rabbi. <laughs> However, in reading the passage from Mark that was selected for this morning, well, I can only describe it by using the Yiddish term beshert, which means meant to be. 
as we heard the text, includes an exchange between Jesus and a scribe. And the scribe asks Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus responds by citing a text that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one. Love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The text that Jesus cites is called in Judaism the Shema, taken from the first word of the Hebrew text, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The first six Hebrew words are a liturgical constant in the Jewish faith, traditionally recited upon rising and when going to bed. The Shema appears in our morning and evening liturgy. The words of the Shema are meant to be the last words that pass between your lips before you die. And if you asked a Jew who is perhaps a little bit distant from their faith, who maybe isn't so sure about which holidays are connected with which stories, who hasn't been in synagogue for a few years, if you ask them to recite the Shema, there is a pretty good chance that they would be able to chant it for you in Hebrew. The appearance of the Shema in the lectionary for this morning isn't just beshert meant to be because you happen to have a rabbi delivering the sermon this Sunday. In Judaism, we have our own lectionary, a Torah portion assigned to each week. And during the course of the Jewish year, we make our way through the five books of Moses, beginning with creation and concluding with the very end of Deuteronomy. And this week, yesterday morning, we read Parashat Ve'etchanan, taken from the beginning of Deuteronomy. And yesterday, this text, the words of the Shema, the same words read here this morning, were chanted in synagogues around the world during the Torah reading. A delightful coincidence, the divine hand, either way, I'll take it. When Jesus responds to the scribe's question about the most important commandment, the verses that he cites have two central verbs, shema and viahafta. Shema means listen or hear or be present. It's one of those words that doesn't neatly translate into English. Any one word translation is an inherent contraction of its Hebrew meaning. The text begins with a command to the Israelites, stop what you're doing, absorb this teaching, let it in Shema. The second verb is viahafta, meaning and you shall love, a commandment to love God, and it is followed by suggestions as to how we might do that with our heart, our soul, and our actions. These texts teach us how to orient ourselves toward God and in so doing model how we might turn toward one another. What is the most important commandment? To listen and to love. Shema, to listen or hear, to absorb, however we want to inadequately translate this Hebrew word, suggests a particular way of accessing the divine. In Jewish tradition, God is more sound than sight. While art museums and holy spaces are filled with glorious representations of God, the Jewish faith has always been uncomfortable with visual depictions of God. In Judaism, to connect with God is to listen, to text, to stories, to traditions passed down. Shema, to listen or to be present or to be ready to receive is an orientation to the divine that can be difficult to cultivate. And yet, in a world where God's presence is obscured and where a relationship or a curiosity or an openness to God is profoundly counterculture, it is necessary in order for us to find holiness. Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel describes it like this, God's grace resounds in our lives like a staccato. Only by retaining the seemingly disconnected notes comes the ability to grasp the theme. There is a holy melody singing to us and it is up to us to listen. And oh, how this applies to our relationships as well, to bring that essence of Shema, of presence, of listening, of openness to our encounters with our loved ones. A colleague shared a story recently about how his son learned to get his attention while he was chatting with congregants after services. His son would begin in that typical way, dad, dad, 
dead. His father would continue talking, not quite listening to his impatient son. Finally, his son stopped yelling dad and started yelling rabbi. <laughs> that got his attention. <laughs> We often don't save our best listening for the ones we love the most. After a long day of work or a weekend of arguing about the iPad or a summer of schlepping to too many different day camps, we can be hearing our loved ones, but perhaps we are not really listening. What is the most important law, Shema? Listen, hear, be present for the signs of holiness and majesty in our lives and for the calls from our loved ones summoning us when we are needed. The Ahafta and you shall love, I will say that when you talk about love or divine love or grace in Judaism, often the response is, that's not really our thing. If you want love, go to St. Columba's or one of our other Christian neighbors. It was Jesus who preached love and Jews famously didn't read the sequel. But the Via Hafta text reminds us, the Jewish community, that love is very much a part of our faith identity. This text chanted daily, twice, a cornerstone of our liturgical life, commands us to love, and then it tells us how, Behol levavcha, with all your heart. And though the Hebrew word lev translates to heart in biblical times, the heart was considered not only the emotional center, but the intellectual center as well. To love is to mix mind and heart, thoughts and feelings. Love is an intellectual exercise, but it cannot only be that. It is an emotional exercise, and yet that alone is not enough. We are called to love by bringing our hearts and minds into alignment. The whole nafshacha with all your soul and with all of your unique essence. You are the only one who can love in your particular way. Jewish theologian Martin Buber taught every person born into this world represents something new, something that never existed before, something original and unique. To love with all of your soul means to love in the way that only you can. Bechol me'odecha, with all of your strength, with all of your deeds, ultimately love is not measured just by thoughts or feelings, words spoken aloud. Love is demonstrated and measured by how you act. To love God and to love each other is to express that love through our actions each and every day. Shema via hafta, listen and love. In Judaism, the Shema at times has been held up as a polemic against other faith traditions. It is the text during which we affirm the unity of God as opposed to other theological beliefs. And yet, here we find Jesus uttering these words, affirming their place as the most important commandment. This Besheret text, this text that was meant to be read in our pulpit yesterday and yours today, carries within it a shared message for all of us. Not because we are all the same. We are not. Our faiths are theologically quite different from one another. Our worship, as you will see if you join us next week at Temple Sinai, is also quite different. And yet Shema and Biahafta teaches us that we need not all worship in the same way or direct our prayers to the same place. If we listen, if we are open to love, then we have what we need to appreciate one another, to be allies in the holy work of repairing the world, and together to walk humbly with our God. Thank you.